Time perhaps to change the way you feel about Vauxhall's Corsa. This fifth generation version aims to surprise in all the ways its predecessor was unremarkable. As a result, on paper at least, it's the most competitive super mini the brand has ever brought us. There's even an all electric model. Vauxhall's Corsa has always been a well-priced, practical super mini, but it's usually been let down by distinctly average engines, a bit of a weight problem, less than cutting edge technology, and the lack of the kind of spark that would really endear you to the thing. All stuff that Vauxhall reckons has been sorted with this fifth generation version. We'll see. The nameplate here dates back to the Corsa A model of 1982, badged as a Vauxhall Nova in the UK. Our market first met the Corsa in 1993, that B model replaced by a Corsa C contender in 2000, uh, before a complete redesign for the Corsa D of 2006. That car was only lightly reskinned to create this model's predecessor, the Corsa E of 2014, a fourth generation model that had to carry on well past its sell by date before it was replaced in autumn. 2019 by the Mark V Corsa F model that we have here. By that point, over 13.5 million Corsas have been sold in Europe, with 2.1 million of those badged as Vauxhalls for the UK market. Here, this Super Mini is almost as much of an institution as its closest rival, the Ford Fiesta, and it's still by far the Griffin Maker's best-selling model. It sells over twice as many units as anything else that the company makes. But uh, as that little history lesson makes clear, it's been an awfully long time since we've seen a completely fresh from the ground up version of this Vauxhall. There's a reason, of course, for this on pass, and it lies with the French PSA Group's £1.9 billion purchase of the Opel and Vauxhall brands back in March 2017. By that point, development on an all-new Mark V Corsa was almost complete and prototypes were pounding the roads around Rosselsheim. But the PSA board ordered that the project should be scrapped and begun again using their more flexible CMP small car platform. Now, unlike the underpinnings that the Opel Vauxhall team had planned to use, uh, those would have required a license fee payable to previous owners General Motors for every car built if PSA had used it. Uh, this chassis could support four-cylinder engines and full electrification too, which was all well and good, but the change in project direction meant the need for a completely new car to be created from scratch in record time. In the event, from start to finish, the project was completed in just two and a half years. That kind of compacted gestation period wouldn't of course been possible had not uh, Chief Engineer Thomas Vanker's development team been able to borrow so much from this car's close cousin, the second generation Peugeot 208, which hit the UK market uh, around about the same time as this Mark V Corsa. The two cars share virtually identical dimensions and of course they share all the same powertrains, including a fully battery powered one which has enabled the range to include the completely electrified Corsa E. Uh, another shared attribute is an emphasis on weight saving. Now that has seen this Vauxhall tip the scales a massive 108 kilos lighter than its predecessor. It is actually now one of the very few super minis that can weigh in at below a ton. Uh, that plays its part in what Vauxhall claims are driver orientated dynamics. Uh, those are sharpened with extensive chassis tuning. There's also a level of camera-driven safety provision and media connectivity which is way above anything Corsa buyers have ever experienced before. Sounds promising, doesn't it? Well, let's put this car to the test. In its mainstream forms, the Corsa has never been known as a particularly fun to drive super mini, but it's a car that's always worked well on UK roads, mainly because in the past, the Vauxhall brand has usually been granted the autonomy from its Opel parent to specifically tune this model line for the terrible tarmac that we have here in Blighty. Uh, that is not the case with this Corsa F. 
possibly because of its hasty gestation period, but more likely because the French PSA group, who now control both marks, have less interest than previous owners General Motors did in differentiating Vauxhalls from Opals. Does that matter? Well, it depends on your perspective. Uh, if you like your driving, then you'll know that it's often the little details that mark really great cars apart from the merely competent ones. And dynamically, there was a potential for this Corsa F design to be a really great super mini. The stiff, sophisticated CMP chassis that membership of the PSA conglomerate had given it is a world away from any platform that the Corsa model line has had before, and it's a major a contributor towards making this car pretty much the lightest in its class. Which means that this car, the fifth generation of Corsa to be seen on the UK market, is the lightest one since the old Corsa C model way back in the year 2000. That of course says as much about the relative antiquity of more recent Corsa engineering as it does about the merits of this fresh model chassis, but it is an encouraging place to start for what is supposed to be the PSA Group's sportiest take on super mini motoring. Uh, to quote again our favourite mantra from Lotus founder Colin Chapman, give a car more power and it'll go faster on the straights, take weight out of it and it'll go faster everywhere. So can this one go faster everywhere than its predecessor, especially through the turns? Well, basically yes, but at the outset you might not want it to because the steering initially has a slightly disconcerting lightness that rather masks the road-holding prowess that this car undoubtedly has. Exactly the sort of thing that in the past the Vauxhall engineers would have dialed out for the twistier roads of the UK market. Of course, typical urban orientated Corsa buyers who will love the way that this uh, rack mounted electric steering motor makes the wheel so easy to twirl around when they're navigating the streets won't care very much about that trait. But if you do, you'll find that things are a little better in this regard if you can progress from a base SE version into the more purposeful mid range SRI level of trim that we're trying here. That's because with this spec, you get a sport button, which as well as an introducing a slightly rortier note to the exhaust adds a bit of extra steering weight at speed, at which point you notice that the helm is actually very accurate with a progressive force buildup that makes this Vauxhall easy to place on the road. Plus, with the SRI grade, this car's suspension is equipped with special strut tower tie rods, which provide a form of cross bracing to create a more solid and more precise feel through the steering. Now, in the past, rally teams used to try to deliver the same effect by installing full cross braces across the engine bay. Uh, this is a simpler way of achieving the same end. Anyway, the result is a bit of extra cornering bite, which at speed through the bends gives this car an admirable tendency to go exactly where you point it. Now we'll come back to drive dynamics after we've talked you through your engine choices. Uh, very few super mini buyers these days want anything beneath the bonnet uh, developing much more than 100 PS and diesel engines have long been marginalised in this segment and that is why uh, from the launch of this particular Corsa virtually all the sales emphasis was on the 75 and 100 PS versions of the 1.2 litre three-cylinder petrol unit that seems to feature these days in virtually everything that the different PSA group brands churn out. Uh, the base 75 PS version of this little power plant is normally aspirated and it makes 60 miles an hour from rest in 12.4 seconds on the way to 108 miles an hour. But with just 118 newton meters of torque, it's somewhat lacking in pulling power. So typical give and take urban driving will require frequent use of the five speed manual gearbox that choosing that baseline unit necessitates you to have. So it's altogether better to bargain your way up into the turbocharged 100 PS version of that engine that the vast majority of Corsa buyers choose. And that's the one we're trying here. It's a great little lump which, as you'd expect, courtesy of the turbo, delivers much more of a shove from low revs uh, with nearly double the amount of pulling power. Uh, there's also a pretty lovely warble as it goes about its business, which is notably less restrained here than it is in the comparable Peugeot 208. That's perhaps another example of the engineer's motivation to make this car feel fractionally sportier than its French cousin. 
In comparison to the base variant, the 60 miles an hour sprint time is reduced to 9.3 seconds and the maximum speed rises to 121 miles an hour. Plus, that's the only engine in the range that gives you a choice of transmissions, either this six-speed manual or a really rather sophisticated auto with no fewer than eight speeds, steering wheel paddles and a drive mode system with eco, normal, sport and manual modes. Uh, use of that transmission is mandatory, the auto transmission with the 130 PS version of the 1.2 litre petrol unit which has been also developed for this car. We can't really see much of a motivation to pay the substantial premium Vauxhall wants for the only other engine on offer, a 1.5 litre turbo D diesel, even though the 102 PS unit is class leadingly clean and economical. Uh, we suppose it might be more suitable in the unlikely event that you were planning to do something like tow a small caravan behind your Corsa, but even in that scenario you might note that the 1.2 tonne braked towing capacity figure of the diesel is no different from that of the turbo petrol unit. Uh, the performance figures, they're very similar too. 60 miles an hour from rest occupies 9.6 seconds on the way to 117 miles an hour. There is one other power plant to talk about and it's not of the combustion engine variety. Uh, to suit the current zeitgeist, there is a version of this car, the Corsa E, which is fully battery powered. Here, as with this model's cousin, the Peugeot E208, a 50 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery is mated to a 100 kilowatt electric motor, putting out 136 PS and working through the usual single speed auto transmission that you get with all EVs. Like all electric vehicles, this one develops all its torque at once and simply hurls itself away from rest. Uh, the 30 miles an hour mark is reached in just 2.1 seconds and 60 miles an hour is crested in only 7.6 seconds and that disguises the fact that also like all EVs that zero emission variant has a bit of a weight problem. Uh, the drivetrain adds over 300 kilos of bulk that other small battery powered little hatches manage that issue a little better is evidenced by the fact that the Corsa E's WLTP rated 209 mile driving range is easily improved on by the latest versions of the Renault Zoe and the BMW i3. Still, all of this does represent a brave new world for forward-thinking super mini buyers who are looking to make the still rather expensive switch into all-electric motoring. It seems like only yesterday, after all, that a fully charged small EV could only manage around half the kind of range that you get from this one. Of course, you certainly won't achieve anything like that kind of operating capability if you get anywhere near this EV's quoted 93 miles an hour top speed, or if you habitually drive your Corsa E in the sports setting that will be necessary to release the full 136 PS power output I just mentioned. The quoted range figure will only be distantly possible if you instead engage a somewhat restrictive eco mode that drops the power output right down to 83 PS. Our focus today though is on the combustion powered Corsa models and if yours is too, uh, for all the reasons we gave earlier, we don't think the engine choice with this Vauxhall will trouble you very much, uh, nor will a poor standard of ride quality. Now true, this can't match the kind of thing that you'll get in a rival Volkswagen Polo, very few super minis can do that, and the fairly basic torsion beam rear suspension system that all small cars feature means you'll certainly feel speed humps and crumbling potholes. Overall though, what's served up in this Corsair is a firm but supple standard of damping that works as well on the open road as it does around town. In development, Chief Engineer Thomas Vanker and his team worked particularly hard on wheel control, which was improved to the extent that allowed them to dial back the intervention of the chassis stability electronics. Uh, you might even notice that if you're an enthusiastic driver, uh, pushing on through damper conditions, uh, you won't find the ESC cutting in all the time as it does in such a scenario in most rival models. Of course, most of the time when you're driving this car, you'll want the benefit of driver assistance features, and there are plenty more of those this time around. Vauxhall particularly wants us to talk about adaptive cruise control and its clever IntelliLux matrix headlights. Those lamps use uh, combinations of LED beam to continually adapt themselves to road conditions and other drivers. 
but we can't see much point because both those features are only available on the top ultimate nav level of trim that hardly any Corsa customers will choose and from launch they couldn't be added into any other model. A few more of the top end variants benefit from what for us is a more important feature on a car like this, a so-called flank guard which works at parking speeds of below 6 miles an hour and uses 12 sensors positioned around the vehicle to warn you if the side of the car is going to collide with an object, a bollard perhaps or another parked vehicle, uh, perhaps even a low set wall. It's a clever touch that would give this car a much needed unique selling point if it were to be fitted right across the range. And this Vauxhall really needs USPs of that kind if it's to stand out in this crowded segment and set itself apart from the PSA group Peugeot and Citroen stablemates uh, and somehow stem the current trend that's drawing customers out of super minis and into the trendier small crossover models that were developed from them. This is the most complete, most sophisticated course there's ever been but we do think it could have been even better if dealer deals are on point though a good showing here might be good enough to deliver the kind of sales figures needed from this car Vauxhall must hope so for the brand's future a lot hangs on it so what do you think this fifth generation Corsa F design is certainly very different from its predecessor. It's been described by Vauxhall as being less van-like and if you come from the previous model that'll certainly be your first impression thanks to 39mm of extra length and a substantial 48mm reduction in roof height. It's certainly more grown-up looking thing with its smarter detailing, shorter overhangs and more vertical windscreen and it now only comes with five doors. Uh, that its dimensions almost exactly replicate those of a second generation Peugeot 208 is hardly a surprise given the CMP platform that both cars share and the extent to which Vauxhall must have had to draw from the engineering of its French PSA group partner during this car's rather rushed period of development. Uh, the resemblance is particularly noticeable here at the side which is characterised by a swept back roof line, a pronounced mid-level crease above the door handles and in usual Vauxhall fashion, a lower swage line that flows upwards towards the rear wheel arch in a blade-like formation. Uh, avoid entry-level trim and you'll get this contrast-coloured black roof which is on trend, but nearly all models are restricted in wheel size to 16-inch rims, which isn't. We have the 17-inch Hurricane 4 twin-spoke alloys here. At the front, the old car's rather dowdy MPV-like look has been replaced by a more purposeful snout with a simpler upper grille, a wider lower air intake and neat corner cutouts that further up the range are filled with these piercing little front fog lamps. Uh, the fussy eagle eye headlight design of the previous model makes way for these sleeker full LED lamps that smear back into the wings in a manner that makes the claim of a class leadingly sleek 0.29 CD aerodynamic drag factor easy to believe. Now for the first time in a Super Mini these lights can be optionally ordered with uh, matrix technology. Vauxhall's Intellilux system which uh, continuously adapts the beam to road conditions and the surrounding traffic. The rear has more presence too. Uh, now although this Corsa F is actually fractionally narrower than the old Corsa E, it appears wider thanks to this sharply defined crease that bisects the top of the tailgate badge and connects the sleeker light clusters which will be LED illuminated provided you avoid entry level trim. Uh, the lower corner cutouts add a bit of visual interest and on the sportive variants this smart roof spoiler offers a neat finishing touch. Now this will be black uh, to match the colour of the roof if you've avoided entry level trim. This contrast coloured top combines well with the livelier palette of colours that are now available shades like voltaic blue and power orange. Uh, we have the more subdued Summit white here which, like almost every other colour option, uh, will cost you extra. 
Of course, as usual, what's more important is what you can't see, and in this case, that's impressively lightweight. Now, in general, thanks to new safety standards and all the extra equipment that they have to carry around, cars have got much heavier over the last decade. And in its previous guise, the Corsa was just about the portliest supermini you could buy. This Corsa F, though, reverses that trend with a massive 108 kilo weight reduction, and that leaves an entry-level version tipping the scales at just 980 kilos. Now some city cars from the next class down weigh more than that. So nothing has been carried over in terms of styling or engineering and you'd expect the same to be true inside too. Which is absolutely the case. Now if you've driven a Corsa before, as most of us have, the Griffin badge on the steering wheel will be the only thing that you'll recognise about this one. Uh, you sit much lower than you did before. The hip point is now 30 millimetres closer to the deck. Apparently, some previous owners felt that the loftier driving position, which previously featured, was a bit MPV-like. And the cabin surrounding you is of considerably higher quality, with glossy black trim that delivers a much more upmarket feel. Although that clashes a little with this SRI model's rather deck chair-like red seat striping. It's certainly true that there isn't quite as plush an ambiance as you get in this car's Peugeot 208 cousin, but that car has to have a curious eye cockpit dash design that forces you to view the instruments over the top of the steering wheel rim. That's something that not everyone likes. Now, if you happen to have tried a Peugeot 208 as part of your round of super mini test drives, you might not find it hard to spot the shared interior fittings, uh, the infotainment system, the window switches, uh, even the key. But equally, we are pleasantly surprised by just how much autonomy the Opel Vauxhall designers were given by PSA in creating their own kind of cabin. Uh, there's far more differentiation here than you get, say, between the cabin architecture designs of different VW, Seat and Skoda Volkswagen Group products. Uh, not all of this is welcome. The oversized Vauxhall gear knob we could do without and the pedal box is tighter than we'd ideally like but generally it's all ergonomically very sound. Design chief Mark Adams and his team having used what they call functional partitioning to split up certain areas. Uh, the seats are supportive, nothing's irritatingly awkward to get to and everything's exactly where you expect it to be. Even the climate functions are properly separated out into controls at the bottom of the centre stack, unlike in a 208. Adams and his team having thankfully rejected the opportunity that PSA Facial Design offered of building these into the central screen. Ah yes, screens. Well, technology also helps, of course, with the greater perception of sophistication. The minimum centre dash monitor size is now 7 inches, and at the very top of the range, you can have a wide, brightly coloured 10-inch HD display, which sadly you can't spec in lower down the lineup. And that's a pity because this 7-inch screen is one of PSA's older fitments. You can tell that by the difference in graphical quality between this display and that which you'll find, say, in a rival Seat Ibiza or VW Polo. The menu structure of this screen is nothing like as intuitive either, plus it's also somewhat restrictive in terms of its informational functions and it also doesn't have the central dial knob and the physical lower buttons that make accessing functions easier with the 10 inch monitor. Uh, there is a DAB tuner, Bluetooth, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring and there's a potential for Wi-Fi connectivity but it doesn't do a lot else unless you happen to have paid extra extra for navigation. Uh, there is basic voice control but it only works via smartphone projection. Still there is potentially more screen functionality in the instrument binnacle that you view through this smart grippy three-spoke leather stitched flat bottom steering wheel. Uh, if you can avoid entry-level trim you'll get a set of digital dials on a seven inch virtual screen. Here though we've got a set of conventional gauges with proper Vauxhall style fonts separated by a 3.5 inch display via which you can access a digital speedo, trip computer, uh, traffic sign recognition and safety graphic functions. As for practicalities, well, our testers had mixed feelings here. As with so many French cars, the glove box is halved in size, 
by an awkwardly shaped fuse box. Uh, Renault's Clio suffers from that failing too. It really is about time that Gallic brands sorted this out. Um, you get the usual connectivity ports in a deep well in front of the gear stick, a 12 volt and a USB socket, plus there's space for a wireless charging mat too, but it can't all be shut away with a cover, so you'll have to leave your smartphone powering up in front of prying eyes. Uh, an overhead sunglasses compartment that's been forgotten, and there's no provision for anything like uh, under seat or passenger footwell storage. But on the plus side, uh, the door pockets are of a reasonable size and they incorporate angled bottle holders. Plus you get ticket clips in the sun visors here. Uh, there are twin cup holders and there's a storage tray down by the electronic handbrake. There are coin slots next to the gear stick. You get the open cubby here by the driver's right knee. There's another small cubby in the door pull and on plusher models, there's this center armrest with its tiny lidded storage box. That's either standard or optional. What else? Uh, well, taller drivers might find the pedals placed a little too close for comfort, but there's plenty of seat height and steering column adjustability. Build quality from the Spanish factory is OK. Apparently, PSA Group boss Carlos Tavares would have liked it to be a bit better, pointing out correctly that when he first sat in his car, the glove box latching mechanism didn't sound very German. It still doesn't. Uh, perhaps it's slightly intentional that the fit and finish here doesn't quite feel quite as assured as it does in the Peugeot 208, given that competing Gallic model's fractionally higher price point. But that's a dangerous game to play, given the way that rivals are improving so much in this regard. Uh, this cabin certainly can't replicate the sheer solidity of a Volkswagen Group product in this segment. Still, there are nice touches. The silver and red fascia panel of this mid-range SRI variant is smart. Uh, the way that little speakers have been uh, incorporated into the A-pillars is clever. And the double stitching on the front door cards looks classy. But the dashboard's glossy black plastic doesn't feel as nice as it looks. And of course, it'll mark easily. Plus, as usual with a car of this kind, quite a few hard plastic mouldings feature around the cabin. Now, that's fine at the bottom of the range, but it's less pleasant if, as is quite likely, you happen to be paying well over £20,000 for your Corsa. Aided by the relative narrowness of these front A-pillars, all-round visibility is better than is the case with some rivals, and that's just as well because rear parking sensors don't come as standard with base SE trim, and you can't add them in cheaply at the bottom of the range. Time to take a look in the rear seat, which is where things start to unravel a little. Uh, there are clear advantages to creating a shared platform that can take both combustion engine and full electric drivetrains, and not only in terms of uh, manufacturing simplicity. For example, the impetus to create the feather light weight figure that we have already referenced was primarily driven by the fact that the designers knew only too well that if they didn't, then the battery powered version was going to end up hopelessly overweight but there are disadvantages too. In the full electric version of this car, you might not mind too much about the prospect of rear bench room being somewhat constrictive if you took into account the need to place the powertrain's battery pack beneath that back seat. Having to accept the very same restrictions in a combustion-powered Corsa just because it happens to have an electrified relative is less easy to accept. Uh, the first sign of this comes when you inspect the narrow rear door opening through which you have to pass to access the back of the car. That's an aperture constricted not just by packaging issues and a rather bulky piece of bodywork over the rear wheels, but also by the substantial reduction in roof height of this fifth generation model that we referenced earlier. If you're particularly tall or you habitually need to reach into the back to fasten things like child seats, you're not going to like that at all. Once inside, it's actually not too bad. Uh, there is certainly less room here than there was in the previous generation Corsa, and that's despite the fact that this Mark V model has 28 millimeters of extra wheelbase length, but there's not much less space than you get in the back of a Fiesta, for example, although that's 
really not saying very much. To be frank, uh, both models are somewhat embarrassed in this regard by some supposedly smaller and much cheaper city cars from the class below, like Hyundai's i10. Uh, there's not much room for either knees or heads. Uh, larger adults, uh, well, they certainly wouldn't want to be spending too long back here. But uh, does that matter, given that for the majority of buyers, these rear seats will only be used occasionally for those above school age? Well, only you can decide. It helps that the designers have done the best with what they had to work with. Uh, the curvature of the front seat backs is designed to improve knee room. There's a notably low central transmission tunnel and there's lots of room to poke your feet beneath these front chairs. Uh, there is hardly anywhere to store things though. Uh, the door bins are tiny and Vauxhall doesn't offer seat back pockets or any kind of overhead light, which does seem a bit mean. Nor has there been any attempt to break up the unremitting drab plastic of the door card. You would also think that modern car designers uh, would realise the importance of offering at least the option of rear connectivity ports. They can't be included here, although you will also find the same issue with rival models. Finally, let's take a look at the boot, which is 309 litres in size. That's 24 litres more than was on offer with the previous generation model. And it's 17 litres bigger than the trunk of a Fiesta. But it's a capacity figure that remains about average by class standards. Vauxhall, though, feels pretty proud that there's no compromising cargo area size if you go for the battery-powered Corsa E variant, which must have taken quite a lot of development effort. There is quite a high loading lip, uh, which you notice because there's no adjustable height boot floor to mitigate that, not even as an option. Uh, these rubber bung attachments on the inside of the tailgate, they seem a bit flimsy and they might quickly go missing. And you only get a couple of floor tie down points and a single bag hook on the right here. It's quite a usable, squarely sized space though, with 885 mils of length and 867 millimetres of width. As usual in this class, there's no seat folding cleverness, uh, stuff like adjustable seat backs for awkwardly shaped loads, a ski hatch or a 40-20-40 rear bench split. Uh, you would think super mini designers might be building that kind of stuff in by now. So instead, there's just a straightforward 60-40 rear bench split, which, once retracted, reveals 1,118 litres of capacity when you load up to the roof. You might expect better quality, classier design and extra technology to equate to higher pricing. And sure enough, that is what's happened here. Uh, from launch, this Mark V Corsa was pitched primarily in the 16,000 to 26,000 pound bracket for the combustion engine models. Uh, for the all electric Corsa E, you'll be paying in the 27 to 31,000 pound bracket. That's once the available 3,500 pound government plug-in car grant has been deducted from the mildly alarming initial asking price. Uh, it's the conventional versions that represent our focus here though and they now come only with five doors. Uh, these are variants that model for model cost around £2,000 more than equivalent versions of their predecessors did which is quite an increase in this sector of the market. Now Vauxhall would of course rightly point out that the extra premium gets you additional equipment features especially in terms of safety and those are things that either cost extra or couldn't be had at all with the previous model. Vauxhall's array of trim grades isn't the easiest to understand, so let's try to talk you through that. Uh, most sales will be the two volume spec packages, SE or as here, SRI. In each case, there are three ways to simply upgrade your car. If you want sat-nav, then there's a nav version. If you want a smarter look and feel, then you can have a premium model. And if on either an SE or an SRI variant you want both, then you can have your car in nav premium form, as is the case here. Uh, what that all means is that it's really not very difficult at all to find your spend on your Corsa spiralling up towards and sometimes over the £20,000 price point. And that'll certainly be the case if you ignore those two volume trim grades and instead opt for the three top ones, Elite Nav, Elite Nav Premium and Ultimate Nav. 
Okay, so that's trim. Uh, what do you need to know about engines and transmission? Well, almost everyone who buys this Corsa uh, will have a 1.2 litre, 100 PS, three cylinder petrol turbo engine. That's what we've got here. Uh, with the SE and Elite variants that feature this power plant, your dealer will offer you the option of an eight speed automatic gearbox for an extra 1,730 pounds. And if you've somehow concluded that a conventional Corsa is worth paying 26,000 pounds for and you're set on top ultimate nav trim uh, you'll have to have that auto shifter the other two mainstream engines have to be had with a manual that'll be an old tech five speed shifter if you go for the uh, range leading unit uh, normally aspirated 75 ps version of that 1.2 liter petrol power plant think carefully before you choose that base engine we think that you'll find the extra 800 pounds to get the 100 ps turbo version of that unit which gets a six speed manual stick shift to be money well spent. We would be less enthused about the prospect of pointing you in the direction of a Corsa diesel. Uh, that only comes with a six-speed manual. Vauxhall obviously thinks it'll sell a few of these, though, because this variant's PSA-sourced 1.5-litre 102 PS Turbo D unit is available with all trim levels bar top ultimate nav. But the premium over the volume turbo petrol engine is over £2,200, an additional sum that we think few buyers in this segment will be able to stomach. Uh, there is another engine option that you can ask your dealer about, a 130 PS version of the 1.2 litre turbo petrol unit that can only be had with automatic transmission. Uh, for the future, Vauxhall promises that the VXR hot hatch badge will be revived with something somewhat sportier, although whatever that is will be in some way electrified like the company's Corsa e-rally concept car. Enough on the range structure, let's position this Corsa for you within Vauxhall's own model lineup before we get into price matching it with super minis from other brands. With the demise of Vauxhall's Viva and Adam's small car models, the Corsa is now the entry point to the company's range. But this super mini isn't massively less expensive than the next model up in the company's lineup, the Astra Family Hatch, uh, which costs only a couple of thousand more. Uh, and that's a premium that gets you a significantly bigger cabin. Onto the value proposition offered by Corsa pricing against rivals from other brands in the Super Mini segment. Now we'll base our comparison against the 1.2 litre turbo petrol 100 PS unit that most customers of this Vauxhall will want. And we'll start with the three cars that tend to lead the segment in sales terms. Ford's Fiesta, Volkswagen's Polo and, in Europe at least, Renault's Clio. Now, in volume form, this Corsa costs fractionally more than an equivalent Polo and fractionally less than a comparable Fiesta, but it is undercut by Renault's Clio by around £1,000. It's also very pertinent to consider the pricing of this car that Vauxhall shares all the engineering with, uh, the Peugeot 208. That typically costs around £800 more. But what about other options in the Super Mini segment? Well, a strong contender is Seat's Ibiza, which packages up Volkswagen Mechanicals more affordably than a Polo does, but it still has a cost that's within a few hundred pounds of an equivalent Corsa, and it feels quite a bit more drab in the cabin. Uh, the same comments apply to equivalent versions of the Toyota Yaris. Also unremarkable inside is the Skoda Scala, although uh, that car does at least have the advantage of offering a really superb level of interior and boot space. It costs around £1,300 more than an equivalent Corsa, though. Uh, even Citroen C3 costs more than Vauxhall will ask you here. Uh, a base version of one of those will cost you around £1,000 more than an equivalent Corsa. Uh, as for comparably priced Super Mini models, well, you might want to consider either the Mazda 2 or the Honda Jazz. Uh, the former is creditable for its infotainment system. The latter is creditable for its clever seat folding tech. If you're interested in a mini five-door hatch, uh, then think in terms of needing to find around £400 more. Of course, there are less expensive Super Minis than this Vauxhall in the segment. Uh, the Griffin brand didn't set out to provide the cheapest offering in the class. This Corsa's cabin probably wouldn't have been as nice as it is if it had. Uh, the usual suspects feature here and all of them require you to accept a much cheaper feeling inside. Uh, also, a smaller boot and a lower level of technology. Uh, arguably, the best of the bunch is Nissan's Micra. Now, that uses Renault engineering and it offers a model-for-model -model saving 
of around 1,200 pounds. But that car is quite a lot smaller inside and it has nothing like as nice a cabin. You could save well over £2,000 over this Corsa by going for Skoda's other super mini, the Fabia. And the saving would probably be around £3,000 if you considered an equivalent version of the Suzuki Swift or possibly the Mitsubishi Mirage. Uh, as for the real budget brands, well, an MG3, that would save you around £6,000 and an equivalent Dacia Sandero, potentially as much as around £8,000. But with those two cars, you really get what you don't pay for. Finally, a quick word about the value proposition of the battery-powered Corsa E. Now, we mentioned earlier that pricing for this zero emissions variant sat in the 27 to £31,000 bracket after government grant deduction. This means that, rather bravely, Vauxhall has priced the base Corsa E around £900 above the entry-level Allure spec version of its Peugeot E208 cousin. And a top GT spec E208 will save you nearly £1,500 over a top Ultimate Nav Spec Corsa E, which is interesting positioning given that the two products are basically the same. Both the Corsa E and the E208, though, make more sense as EVs than another key zero emission small car rival at this price point, the Mini Electric. That Mini is priced from around £28,000 and it has a much lower operating range, a three-door only body style and a tiny boot. Plus, it would probably cost around £3,000 more when equipped to a similar standard. Uh, there aren't really any other direct all-electric small hatch options. Uh, you can get battery-powered versions of the Volkswagen Up, the Seat Mi and the Skoda Citigo uh, from around £20,000, but they're all smaller city cars. A battery-powered family hatch like a Kia e Nero would cost around £5,000 more and a BMW i3 even more than that. But, as we said earlier, it's a combustion engine course of variants that are our focus here. If, having considered the value proposition that we've outlined concerning these, you conclude that it is this Vauxhall that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous the brand has been when it comes to that standard specification. So, let's take a look at that now. Now, even entry-level SE variants come pretty well equipped with LED headlights featuring high beam assist, 16-inch silver for twin-spoke alloy wheels, and a reasonable tally of camera safety kit. And we're going to get to that in a moment. Inside in an SE spec variant, there's air conditioning, there's a flat-bottomed leather-stitched steering wheel, uh, there's a trip computer and cruise control with an intelligent speed limiter. Now that will adjust itself to the prevailing limits so you should never have to be zapped by a speed camera again. Infotainment is taken care of by a 7-inch multimedia radio center dash touchscreen featuring Apple CarPlay, and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, uh, Bluetooth and a decent quality six-speaker DAB audio system. Here, as mentioned earlier, we've gone for the sportier SRI trim level that many buyers will want. Uh, these variants are recognisable by the black contrast colouring used for the roof and the A-pillars, plus a range of extra touches, dark tinted rear windows, a rear roof spoiler, high gloss black B-pillars, uh, chrome effect exhaust tailpipe extensions, LED front fog lights and LED tail lamps. Plus, the 16-inch wheels are of a more dynamic Hurricane for twin-spoke design. Rear parking sensors are added to this level too. Inside in an SRI spec model, you'll find the cabin marked out by the addition of sports-style seats and a 7-inch digital instrument cluster to replace the usual instrument binnacle dials. Plus, there's a sport switch which firms up the steering and adds a slightly rortier exhaust note. At uh, the beginning, we referenced the fact that you can embellish the spec of your SE or SRI spec Corsa with three extra packs. The nav pack adds Vauxhall's multimedia Navi GPS setup, which has 2D and 3D street level mapping, European coverage, and the points of interest search function. Uh, the premium pack gives you auto headlamps and wipers, uh, an anti-dazzle rear view mirror, and heated seats. Plus, SE premium models get rear parking sensors and 
provided they have manual transmission, a heated steering wheel too. Uh, if you go for the premium pack on an SRI variant, uh, that will cost a little more because at this level it also includes larger 17-inch wheels that better fill the arches, plus electronic climate control, uh, power folding mirrors, uh, keyless entry system and a heated steering wheel. And that's regardless of transmission choice. Obviously, with a NAV Premium model like the one we have here, uh, you'll get all the elements of the two packs that we've just mentioned uh, combined together. It's worth pointing out that providing you avoid a base spec SE model without any of the packs fitted, your Corsa will come with the Vauxhall Connect package, which gives you quite a lot. Uh, first and foremost, there's an e-call system that at the press of a button, 24-7, 365 days a year, will put you in touch with a trained advisor in the event of an emergency or a breakdown. And it will automatically alert the emergency services if the airbags go off in an accident. You Using a downloadable MyVoxel app, Voxel Connect will also give you access to live navigation services so you can plan a route in advance on your PC and then forward it to your car, saving a lot of faffing around when you get in at the start of your journey. Uh, there is also regular vehicle diagnostics info, plus the app will allow you to lock or unlock your car via your phone from wherever you are in the world. It can even let you or someone you nominate access and start the car using a smartphone. Uh, Vauxhall Connect additionally includes a range of specific services for Corsa e owners, including trip planning, remote settings, and public charging solutions. Okay, so that's covered off the mainstream trim levels. Let's go further up the range. Uh, if you're wanting to spoil yourself a little in your choice of Corsa, but you need some variance in engine choice, then your dealer will point you towards the plush Elite Nav models. Now these also get the contrast colored black roof, but uh, they're distinguishable from the SRI variants by a different eight spoke alloy wheel design and chrome effect lower side window finishing. At this level in the range, as you'd expect, you get navigation and all the features that would be fitted to the SE version of the Premium Pack, along with a panoramic rear view camera, uh, front parking sensors, part leather effect upholstery, a center front armrest, which includes storage, and on the auto models, uh, an electric parking brake. Plus, uh, there's some extra camera safety features that we'll cover off in a moment. If an Elite Nav model is what you want, then your dealer will encourage you to find another £1,360 to get it with the optional premium pack. And that's your passport to the larger 10-inch HD multimedia Navi Pro version of this car's centre dash screen. Plus, that premium pack gets you keyless entry, electronic climate control and 17-inch diamond cut gloss black five twin spoke alloy wheels. All of that extra premium stuff comes as standard on the ritziest trim level, that's Ultimate Nav, along with some real niceties like an electrically operated massaging driver's seat and perforated leather upholstery inserts. Uh, there's also adaptive cruise control, which automatically adjusts your speed to suit prevailing traffic on the highway. And you get Intellilux LED matrix headlights that constantly adapt themselves to road conditions and surrounding traffic. We'll finish our perusal of standard spec by covering off what you get in the battery-powered Corsa E, which comes in two forms, SE Nav and Elite Nav. Um, SE Nav gets you everything you really need, stuff like navigation, climate control, auto headlamps and wipers, and rear parking sensors, plus there are 16-inch bicolor wheels, but if the deal on offer is strong enough, uh, you really might not be able to resist the draw of a Corsa E with top Elite Nav spec, which adds that 10-inch HD Multimedia Navi Pro center dash screen, the Intellilux LED matrix headlights, a contrast colored black roof, LED front fog lights, heat for the front seats and the steering wheel, a front center armrest, part leather effect seat trim, a seven inch digital instrument cluster and some extra camera safety kit, plus dark tinted rear windows and a set of 17 inch bicolor diamond cut alloy wheels. 
On to options. Uh, there are actually hardly any because for owners wanting to embellish things a bit without progressing up the trim hierarchy, Vauxhall provides those additional uh, nav premium and nav premium extra cost packs we referred to earlier. But it would have been good to have had a bit more flexibility in spec choice. As it is, the way things are, you can't, for example, affordably add rear parking sensors onto uh, the base SE variant on their own, as many owners might want to. Um, it's necessary instead to upgrade to that pricey premium pack. Uh, you can't add the larger 10-inch centre dash screen into mainstream SE or SRI models, and you can't add the 7-inch digital instrument cluster into any kind of SE spec model. Nor can mainstream SE or SRI variants be optionally kitted out with the choicest elements of Vauxhall's camera-driven safety technology. Nor can the adaptive cruise control system which is fitted to the top ultimate nav variant be optioned onto any other model. Bear in mind that uh, like most brands these days Vauxhall penalizes you on paint choice unless you choose the single solid standard color blazer blue then you'll have to pay your dealer extra for your choice of shade that's even if you go for the rather basic summit white shade we have here. Uh, there are four two coat metallic choices and two top two coat premium paint colors power orange and hot red. If you don't like the contrast colored black roof which as we mentioned earlier is standard above entry level trim uh, then there is the no cost option of having that in body color. Uh, you will also need to budget a bit extra for an emergency spare wheel if you don't want to be stuck by the side of the road uh, fiddling with a tire repair kit the next time you have a puncture. Let's finish with a look at safety. Uh, you'd expect a modern super mini these days to come with some sort of autonomous braking system fitted as standard across the range and this course doesn't disappoint. Uh, the automatic emergency city braking active safety brake system is standard fit and that works in conjunction with a standard forward collision alert setup and it works at speeds between 3 and 53 miles an hour as you drive, scanning the road head in search of potential collision hazards. If one's detected, then you'll be warned. If you don't respond, or perhaps you aren't able to, then at speeds of below 90 miles an hour, your course will autonomously brake itself to a complete stop with 0.9 G of braking, avoiding the obstacle. At speeds between 19 and 53 miles an hour, speed will be reduced by up to 14 miles an hour. This system can specifically identify vehicles, pedestrians, bikes and motorbikes. Other standard safety features include lane departure warning with lane assist, which alerts you if you drift out of your lane and applies subtle corrective lock to steer you back to where you ought to be. Uh, like automatic emergency city braking, uh, we've found that this feature works smoothly and unobtrusively with a refreshing lack of too many jerks, beeps and bongs. Uh, what else is standard in terms of camera safety kit? Well, there's a driver's attention warning, driver drowsiness system, which uh, monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness, which, if it's detected, will prompt a warning to stop for a restorative coffee, and it will automatically warn you to take a break if you've been driving for more than a couple of hours at speeds of above 40 miles an hour. Uh, there's also traffic sign recognition, which pictures speed signs as you pass and then displays them on the dash. Uh, that's what drives the intelligent speed limiter we mentioned earlier. Also, as mentioned earlier, there is that e-call system as part of Vauxhall Connect, which will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location in an accident. Despite all of that, this Corsa wasn't able to achieve a full five-star showing in Euro NCAP safety tests. Poor whiplash protection for rear seat passengers apparently brought the score down to four stars out of five. Nevertheless, NCAP scores of 84 and 86 percent respectively for adult and child occupant protection are well up to the class standard. More usual safety inclusions that of course feature here include Isofix charge seat fastenings on the outer rear seats, uh, a tyre pressure monitoring system, hill start assist to uh, stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and twin front side and curtain airbags, although unfortunately there's no driver's knee airbag. 
Plus, of course, all the usual electronic assistance for stability and traction control. There's cornering brake control for extra stability through the turns and a drag torque control feature which stops destabilization of the car which would otherwise occur if you were to suddenly lift off the throttle or change down to too low a gear on a slippery road. As we mentioned earlier, you'll also get a welcome dose of standard headlamp technology across the range, the extra reach of full LED beams and standard high beam assist which will automatically dip your headlights for you at night. If you want more in terms of safety kit, then you'll need to opt for one of the Elite Nav or Ultimate Nav models, which come with two further features. Side blind spot alert warns you if you're just about to dangerously pull out into the path of an oncoming vehicle. Less familiar to us, but very welcome, is what Vauxhall calls flank guard. Now, this works at parking speeds uh, below six miles an hour, and it uses 12 sensors positioned around the vehicle to warn you if the side of the car is about to collide with an object. Uh, audio signals increase in frequency the closer you get to the obstacle. I mean, how many parking things might that feature have prevented for you over the years? Uh, it is also worth mentioning that the panoramic rear view camera, which is standard on the Elite Nav and Ultimate Nav models, shows a 180 degree field of view behind the car. So that's able to show you traffic approaching from from both left and right as you reverse. Now, the PSA group hasn't yet strayed into offering any kind of semi-autonomous driving tech on this class of car in the way that, say, top versions of the rival Renault Clio do. Adaptive cruise control, that's the closest that this Corsa gets in that regard. We expected a lot from this car in terms of running cost efficiency, having prior to this test noted the impressive strides that its engineers had made in reducing curb weight, particularly given the use by volume variants of the three-cylinder 1.2-litre PSA Group engine that we've found to be impressively clean and frugal in the other Peugeot, Citroën and Vauxhall models in which we've tried it. Now we'll start with the weight thing because it's a big deal and not many super minis these days weigh in at less than a tonne but this is one of them. The 980 kilo curb weight figure of an entry level model being a full 108 kilos less than was the case with the previous generation design. A weight reduction roughly equivalent to the saving that you'd make if you were to ask an adult and a teenage passenger to get out and walk. Uh, not since the Corsa C model of the year 2000 has a version of this. Vauxhall Super Mini weighed so little. The use here of the PSA Group's latest CMP platform contributes most towards reduction, as you might expect it would. But the Opel Vauxhall design team also had to do quite a lot else to achieve it. Uh, replacing a steel bonnet with aluminium uh, saved 2.4 kilos. Redesigning front and rear seats saved 10 kilos. Uh, savings in the body and white structure contributed 40 kilos. And a switch to an all-aluminium engine range was equally significant. Given all that effort, it's actually a fraction disappointing to find that the fuel and CO2 readings of this car aren't class leading across the board, but they still are extremely good. Uh, with a 1.2 litre turbo petrol 100 PS unit, the most choose, you're looking at up to 52.3 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle and 96 grams per kilometre of any DC rated CO2 if you opt for a manual gearbox. With the 8-speed auto, the figures are 48.7 mpg and 190. 19 grams per kilometer. To give you some class perspective, a rival Ford Fiesta 1 litre EcoBoost 95 PS model does fractionally better, while a directly comparable Renault Clio TCE 100 is marginally more frugal but also marginally dirtier. A 1 litre TSI 95 PS Volkswagen Polo though can't quite match this showing. It records 50.4 mpg and 105 grams per kilometer. If you'd rather stick with a Corsa powered by the normally aspirated 75 PS version of that 1.2 litre petrol engine, the figures are 53.3 mpg and 93 grams per kilometre, uh, the CO2 figure being 10 to 15 percent better than you get from entry-level petrol versions of the Fiesta, Clio and Polar models just mentioned. Uh, that kind of strong efficiency showing is as much about engine technology as it is about light weight of course, and the three-cylinder petrol units that have been developed with an emphasis on minimizing mechanical losses due to friction. 
Switch your attention to the Corsa 1.5 litre turbo D diesel variant and the opposition melts away a bit thanks to official figures which suggest uh, that a WLTP rated combined cycle fuel return of up to 70.6 mpg is possible along with any DC rated emissions of 85 grams per kilometre readings that are way better than those of any other diesel super mini in the segment bar of course the Peugeot 208 Blue HDI 100 which shares exactly the same engineering. The PSA people certainly seem to have a lead in diesel technology. Their black pump fuel units feature a clever three-step after-treatment system designed to better eliminate the four nasty pollutants that diesel units usually put out, namely unburnt hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen oxides and particulates. Uh, the first stage sees the unwanted hydrocarbon and carbon monoxide elements converted into harmless water and carbon dioxide. In the second Second stage, that nasty nitrogen oxide also gets converted into water via a selective catalytic reduction process which uses the uh, urea and water mixture add blue. Now you'll need to get that topped up every 12,500 miles. And finally, in the third step, a uh, particulate emissions filter eliminates virtually all particulates at a stroke. Whatever your engine choice, you'll be helped by the meticulous engineering which has gone in here. Uh, take the sleek 0.29 CD drag factor. That's difficult to beat in this class. An Audi A1, for example, manages 0.31 CD. Uh, the Opel Vauxhall development team put so much effort into achieving this because they discovered prior to this course's development that a 10% reduction in drag could result in a reduction of around 2% in any DC rated fuel consumption and around a 5% reduction when you're traveling at motorway speeds. Uh, the drag coefficient gains were achieved by incorporating into this design features like a smooth underbody and an active aero shutter in the front grille which automatically closes or opens when cooling air is least needed. Uh, that's a rare feature in this class. Other innovations helped too. Uh, the engineers reckon that the switch to full LED headlights alone saved 1.3 grams of NEDC rated CO2. Of course, you'll have to do your bit as a driver to get anywhere near the published fuel figures. To help you, the Centre Dash infotainment screen's trip computer section gives you readouts for current fuel consumption and for remaining range. Plus, it'll tell you how long the stop and start system has been functional for on any given trip. Although we're not really sure why you'd ever want to know that. For some though, thinking about fuel consumption and smoky emissions will all be very yesteryear in these days of melting polar ice caps. And it's for those people that the battery powered Corsa E full electric version of this car has been developed with its 50 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery and 100 kilowatt electric motor. This drivetrain claims to be state of the art for a small car, although its uh, WLTP certified range of 209 miles is bettered in this class by the BMW i3, which records up to 223 miles, and by the Renault Zoe, which in 52 kilowatt hour form manages up to 242 miles. It is worth pointing out though that both those rivals cost significantly more, uh, the BMW particularly so, and a more closely priced zero emission rival, the Mini Electric, that can offer a WLTP range of only 144 miles. If you are a Corsa E owner, you'll need to know that getting anywhere near the quoted range figure will necessitate staying in the powertrain's provided eco mode. Uh, activating its sport mode setting will reduce your range by around 10%. What about charging times? Well, using the 7 kilowatt wall box you'll need to get installed in your garage if you're a Corsa E owner. A full charge from empty will take seven and a half hours. If, when you're out and about, you find a public 50 kilowatt rapid charger, the replenishment time to charge from 15 to 80 percent is 45 minutes. If you're fortunate enough to find a 100 kilowatt rapid charger, that falls to 30 minutes. If the charger in question is a 22 kilowatt accelerated public charger, then the replenishment time will vary depending on whether you've paid a bit extra to get the Corsa E's standard 7.4 kilowatt onboard charger upgraded to 11 kilowatt spec. Uh, if you do that, you can reduce the five hour 
hour replenishment time uh, with that kind of charger to three hours and 20 minutes. At uh, the point of purchase of a Corsa E, Vauxhall will throw in a free six month subscription to BP's Charge Master Polar Network, which after that point would, at the time of this test, cost you £7.85 a month. What else might you need to know? Uh, well, we'll switch back to the combustion engine models that are our primary focus in this test and tell you that there's the usual stop-start system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, when you're stuck at the lights or waiting in traffic. Uh, as a Corsa owner, you can download a useful My Vauxhall app uh, via which you can take care of your Vauxhall online and book maintenance visits, uh, which, by the way, will be needed every year or 12,000 miles for the petrol engines and every year or 20,000 miles for the diesel. There are, of course, plenty of Vauxhall outlets to choose from, so you should never be too far from one. On that subject, at point of purchase, you can get a prepaid Vauxhall care servicing plan uh, for a relatively small monthly payment over three years. This will cover you for three services and an MOT, plus it'll give you three years of roadside assistance. Insurance ratings are reasonably comparable with uh, other mainstream brand models in this segment. Uh, you're looking at Group 10E for the base 1.2 litre 75 PS petrol unit and Group 16E or 17E for the volume 1.2 litre 100 PS petrol engine. Uh, residual values on courses are better than they used to be. Independent experts reckon that residual values over a typical three year 36,000 mile ownership period will vary between 36 and 41% with the electric model at the top of those projections. Uh, to give us some class perspective, that's a bit better than you get from a Fiesta, but it's not quite as good as would be managed by a well-looked-after Renault Clio. Uh, that can achieve up to 46% of its value over the same period. Finally, you'll have to know about warranties. And now in a class where Hyundai and Toyota offer standard five-year warranties and Kia offers a seven-year package, Vauxhall, like most of its other rivals, persists with the usual three-year, 60,000-mile package. Uh, that can be extended up to five years and 100,000 miles at extra cost. Uh, a year's free breakdown cover is provided, along with a six-year anti-corrosion guarantee. Vauxhall has produced a much better Corsa, of that there's no doubt. It's smarter, quieter, classier and more sophisticated than any of its predecessors. But it's also considerably more expensive too, so it's just as well that you're getting plenty more in return. Now if you're graduating into this Mark V version from the previous model, you might even feel that you've missed an interim generation. The improvement in quality and technology really is that great. In some ways, of course, you have the stillborn version of this car that we never saw, which was canned because of the PSA Group takeover in 2017, must have helped the Vauxhall Opel engineers in determining how this eventual Corsa F should turn out. That development team had been ruminating over what this model should be for the best part of a decade, but in the event, they only had 30 months to create it. Given that challenge, what's been produced here really is truly impressive. But it's certainly not faultless. We can't help thinking that the determination to produce a full electric version with exactly the same platform and cargo area as the combustion engine variants must have had an impact on the packaging compromises which have restricted rear seat space in this car. And there's unfulfilled dynamic potential here too. Given the impressive new super light curb weight, uh, there was the potential for this car to fully rival the class leading handling sharpness that distinguishes its Ford Fiesta arch rival, which might have happened had Vauxhall been allowed to tune the dynamic response of this car for British roads in the way that it did do with previous generation Corsa models. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the significant pricing increase which comes with this Mark V model, although it is perhaps justified given the improvements made, might give even the most loyal Corsa buyer cause for thought. 
Despite all this, we fervently hope that this car will meet its maker's optimistic sales projections because if it doesn't, the Vauxhall Mark's whole future might come into question. So heavily does the Griffin maker depend on this model. There's no place within the PSA group for an underperforming brand, especially now that conglomerate has merged with Fiat Chrysler. If Vauxhall dealers are allowed the scope to be competitive with their pricing and with their PCP finance projections, that shouldn't happen because, logically, there aren't actually many reasons why super mini buyers shouldn't very much like this car. True, it's not class leading in any particular area, but it is a very mature feeling little thing with a combination of virtues that's difficult to beat. It's a small Vauxhall for which no apologies need to be made, and that will worry obvious super mini rivals. After all, this model's predecessors had nothing like the depth of engineering and quality of this car, yet they still racked up very respectable sales. This time around, the Corsa aims to sell on more than just sheer value, and it might just manage it.